And I'm delighted to say, by the way, that we've got an amazing panel tonight. We have the assistant comment editor at The Telegraph, Olivia Utley. She's in the house, getting it done, let me tell you. Also, we have social commentator and writer and broadcaster Mo Lovett. And brand new to Tonight Live, a warm welcome to political commentator Tom Spencer. Bye. Very inspirational. Yes, and uh, Tom, it's important, isn't it, for public figures uh, like this young woman to be open about the struggles of fame. You know, I think that's what's unique about her is that uh, she she kind of wore her heart on her sleeve. Mm, yeah, it's it, it's something we see all the time. Uh, the uh, glamour and it, the people you really appreciate who do just say the honest realities of, of being famous and that's mm. just what Sarah did so well. Definitely and kids with me throughout the show is my brilliant panel tonight assistant comment editor at The Telegraph Olivia Rutley, social commentator and writer Mo Lovett and brand new to Tonight Live political commentator Tom Spencer. So Tom resistance is futile Covid passports are coming. Um, I think it's actually a, a very good thing that they're uh, c c coming. If you go out without um, being fully uh, vaccinated, which yeah. everyone is able t t to get a, a vaccine now, you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting at risk every single person who you come into contact with. So I'm much more comfortable with that when I I go out past um, September, I'll know that myself, my family, my friends are at much less risk as a result of that happening. So Tom Spencer backing this policy, what do you think, Mo Lovett? Um, fundamentally against it, Tom, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, um, you know, what's really bizarre about this, Mark, as well, is, is the timing of it. I mean, you know, we've had a horrendous pandemic. I'm not somebody who doesn't, you know, doesn't un underestimates how terrible uh, this has been and the devastating impact it's had on people. But we have got such a huge majority of the population, including or a huge take up in, in terms of the most vulnerable people in society, that the timing of this as we reach the sort of tail end of the pandemic is ridiculous. And I think what the government are doing is they're, they're worried about the spread of infection when schools go back, but there are always infections when schools go back. You know, there are always problems with, um, you know, colds, coughs and colds that go around in the autumn term, and uh, things like flu and RSV. And actually children are far more susceptible to serious illness from flu and from RSV. So the timing of this just doesn't make any sense. And for me, a kind of paper please society, I've, I've known people who've lived in these societies before, they don't just change the relationship between the individual and the state that you have to prove who you are in order to kind of uh, to enter any kind of social life. But they actually change the relationship between us as citizens because somebody has to check the card, somebody has to present the card and somebody has. It's a horrible way for a society to be governed. And so I'm fundamentally against it. There's a theme emerging, isn't there, in this government, Olivia Utley, in which they say for months they won't do something and then they do it. And here we go with vaccine passports, which were denied earlier on in the pandemic. Denied over and over and over again. And I entirely agree with Mo that it changes the way society is run. It changes the uh, citizens' relationship with the state. It changes citizens' relationship with each other. Hate the idea of a papers, please, society. But as Mo says, I mean, the timing is bizarre for a number of reasons. One of them being that the Delta variant is has changed the whole the, the whole lay of the land, really, because we now know that vaccines are very, very good, still always have been, at keeping people protected from serious illness and death. But with Delta, they're not actually that good at preventing transmission. So what's the point of having a Delta? I mean, we've all heard of all these kids at Reading who've all, you know, 19, 20 year olds who've all had their jabs. Um, they've all got it. I've, I've known so many people who've got COVID pretty mildly um, after having the jab. So th there's, there's no incentive for it really anymore because yes, you show your vaccine passport, you go in, you still might well have asymptomatic or mild COVID um, and then you pass it around. I mean, if anything, there's a case for, for test on the mm. door if we want to do that. There's an argument for that. 
I think that we are pretty much at the end of this pandemic and there's probably no need and we will see little spikes here and there, but that probably doesn't matter so much in the grand scheme of things. But the case for vaccine passports has completely disappeared. So now, as well as it being uh, immoral, I think it's just a bit stupid. Tom, with the, the vaccine, which uh, Olivia has said, you know, she's enthusiastic about and, and it's very clear that it's effective in stopping deaths and, and hospitalizations to, to, to the same extent than, than pre-vaccine. But... Uh, we're stuck with that infrastructure. If you have vaccine passports, they will be used for years to come in all sorts of ways, linking your medical status to your liberty and access to services. Um, well, it's something that doesn't have to be an, uh, an eternal thing. When you create the statute to be able to put forward the vaccine passport, you can create a, a, a limit. So, for example, if you said where the where R is less than 0.67 as just a, a, a potential idea, it doesn't have to be the case that we just have a indefinite rule that vaccine passport exists. And I wouldn't support the, um, a measure to bring in vaccine passport unless it did have that sort of limit. Time limited. But then what about the Coronavirus Act, which keeps being updated every six months? I mean, COVID's not going away, is it, Tom? And therefore, the pressure to keep these COVID passports going would be with us indefinitely, because once you've had your jab, it's all about the booster. Have you had your booster? Mm. Um, well, we can still maintain the sort of uh, political pressure and ensure that this doesn't become an infinite thing like the um, current, current COVID bill seems uh, to, uh, to be. And there hasn't actually been that much lobbying in Parliament itself, or at least there's nowhere near a uh, majority to indicate the case that people do want to repeal in full the, uh, the COVID Act. And until people start lobbying their MPs better and winning them over, then there's really no chance that it will go. But when the statute is designed, because it's not actually been been made incomplete yet, we can ensure that it is done in a way that means we won't be stuck with this kind of thing forever. Tom Spencer, Mo Lovett and Olivia Utley join me after 10.30. What are you with me until midnight is an amazing panel tonight, I've got to say. The Telegraph's Olivia Utley, social commentator and writer Mo Lovett and political commentator Tom Spencer. Now, here's a shocking story. Incredible scenes from Brazil. Uh, Brazilian federal police stormed onto the pitch during Brazil, Argentina to detain four Argentinian players who fail to disclose their full quarantine status as they are based in Britain. This is extraordinary. In another controversial government plan, it's been revealed by the Mirror that it will cost the government... Oh, so apologies, we're moving on to another story now. We just wanted to give you the headline of that. Uh, let's move on to our next story. And it is as follows. As I mentioned, a controversial government plan. It's been revealed by the Mirror that it will cost the government around £120 million over the next decade in their plans to force all voters to show ID. The plan to introduce voter ID is said to crack down on voter fraud at polling stations but in the last seven years, only three people have actually been convicted. But in a devastating document, the Cabinet Office estimates the policy, which will cost between 65 million and 180 million over the next 10 years, with a central estimate of 120 million pounds. The move has also been criticised by campaigners who say that the policy will be marginalised. It will make poorer people poorer and affect older voters. Of the total amount, around 55 million will be spent on more detailed polling cards which will have to change from A5 to A4, while another 15 million will sp be spent by councils producing plastic voter cards for the estimated 2.1 million Brits who may not have suitable ID. Labour have vowed to oppose the entire bill on Tuesday, saying it will rig democracy in favour of the Conservative Party. Do we have a view on voter ID? Um, I'm going to be quite boring and be relatively balanced on it. I think that Starmer's line on this and the Mirror's line, this devastating report, is rubbish. Mm. 120 million over the over 20 years isn't a huge amount of money for the yeah. government, actually. Right. Um, and also, I don't think that it's going to massively skew the, skew, you know, it's not gerrymandering, it's not skewing the vote towards mm. Conservative voters. It's already been happening in Northern Ireland for years and there's been no problem. It happens all over the world. In fact, there was a really interesting poll, I thought, showing that something like, I think it was 40% of voters already think that you have to bring ID with you to the polling station yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I don't think it's a massive deal. Um, and I don't think we should be, you know, wringing our hands over it. But 
I don't particularly like it as a development. Um, it's all part of the sort of same papers please society as the vaccine passports. Mm. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't like the idea of an extra layer of bureaucracy, really. Mm. And I can imagine that there will be a few people who, you know, run into the polling station last thing after work and aren't able to vote because they don't have their ID cards and, mm. and, and that will be a bit of a waste. Although you could argue that we shouldn't fix a, a system that is already not broken. I mean, the... the the, the, the allegations of corruption are very minimal in this country, aren't they? Well, that's the other thing. I, I, I agree. I don't think it's a good development, but I just don't think all of this sort of devastating mm. report, 120 million and stuff is Well, I suppose overdone. potentially what it does, Mo Love, it is it, it will see off any potential corruption at the past. And we've seen America almost in, indulging in a sort of civil war about whether the election was stolen last time round. And, and maybe if we introduce this system, we won't ever have to have those conversations. You see, you talk about America. This story reminds me a little bit about the West Wing. I don't know if anybody's a West Wing fan. Yes. But there was, a, there was a contingent of people who were against flag burning and they went to President Bartlett with this campaign to ask him to, uh, you know, make it make it legal to burn the American flag. And President Bartlett, after hearing all the evidence, he said, have we got a massive rise in flag burning in the US? And this story reminds me of that. We don't have a massive issue with voter fraud. And when you think about what happened in America and all of that um, to and fro about where was the election stolen, actually, that's part of a much wider um, anti-democratic sentiment that people mm. don't, don't uh, agree with democratic consent. Not my president, not my prime minister. Mm. All of that sort of thing that you mentioned in your early monologue. Mm. I think we've got a societal problem with people not really kind of valuing democracy and the outcome of democratic votes, I think that's probably more worrying. And I don't see how... I think there's probably a bit more of a problem of people not being able to get into vote because they haven't brought their, 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 their Olivia, actually. I do think it is a bit disenfranchising, actually. Why do we need that uh, uh, level of um, administration on top? Well, Tom, what you should do, shouldn't you, is make it as easy as possible for people to vote. Mm, yeah, I, I, I think that's a very simple pr uh, pr principle, which I think everyone w can... I, 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 can uh, support. Mm. Uh, if we are to, to make it steps to, to make it harder for, for people to, to vote, we need to have a very good reason for, for doing that. And the evidence simply is, which I think we all uh, agree on, we don't have a, a voter fraud problem. And so what's actually the benefit of making it harder for, for people to vote? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a fair point. And I think the cost is definitely a red herring. But how do you feel about the idea of requiring photo ID to cast your vote? GBviews at gbnews.uk. In April, the World Health Organization's Director General said that there was a shocking imbalance in the global distribution of vaccines. So what do we think? Uh, Tom, do you think we should share our jabs? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Um, the, po the reason we, uh, we have bought the vaccine is because we want to ensure that we don't reach the kind of COVID outbreaks uh, which we saw earlier this year, but simply b blockading off the, uh, the vaccine and ensuring that they only come here will simply result in in a very over uh, vaccinated Britain and a very under vaccinated uh, rest of uh, of the world. So the most important thing to me is that we get as many people globally uh, vaccinated as possible. And if we're simply just hoarding them here, then that's simply just. Mm a waste of quite scarce uh, resources. Yeah, Olivia, what do you think? Should we share our jabs? I completely agree. Um, and I think that Gordon Brown puts it quite well, actually. I think it really is a moral outrage. I think the way we're all banging on about booster jabs, when we don't even know if, if boost, booster jabs are going to be at all effective, that they're going to help at all. And we're talking about potentially, you know, people my age getting a booster jab. I was never at risk from COVID really to begin with. Yeah. And I know they're not saying that yet, but it, that's probably coming later down the line. And I actually think it's a bit gross the way we're even talking about that when there are mm. whole African nations where no one's been vaccinated. And also from a, I mean, that's from the sort of humanitarian point of view, but Brown's completely right to say that it's in our interest. It will just, we know that that COVID mutates when it can spread freely and when there aren't vaccines. And it will come back to our shores in a different form, which could possibly be vaccine resistant. So I think it's mad to be stockpiling them and, and they might just go off in the warehouses and then no one gets to use well, them. Well, absolutely. And we're talking about vaccinating millions of 12 to 15 year olds, Mo, when the JCVI who advised the government on vaccinations have said it's not worth the risk. Mm -hmm. And yet these jabs could go abroad where they're definitely needed.
I mean, we saw some of the worst of the vaccine nationalism, didn't we, with mm. the EU and the AstraZeneca um, debacle. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry to sound a bit uh, samey as the rest of the panel, but I, I, I do actually agree. I mean, I thought when the COVAX um, initiative, you know, to give all these doses to poorer countries who hadn't been able to afford to, uh, you know, kind of contribute to the research and the, and the development of the vaccine, I thought that was a really good thing. Mm. And we just haven't uh, met our commitment on that. And I think there's actually a way in which the African continent has been overlooked completely in this pandemic, you know, in terms of the tourism, in terms of put on, put, uh, being put on the red list um, unnecessarily. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit frightened that Africa as a continent is become, going to become isolated um, because, because of COVID. And I, I think that would be a very bad thing. I don't want us to become inward looking mm. um, because of COVID. I want us to be outward looking and I want us to think about the rest of the world as well. So, yes, I agree with everybody on the panel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, do you think that there is going to be a change in emphasis about the vaccine in this country once the majority of people, or the majority of people who had had one jab already over 70 percent? But do you think that as the pandemic hopefully tails off, this obsession with getting everyone vaccinated will will actually ebb away? Um, sure. Yeah. So that's something which I'd be quite surprised if it uh didn't ha happen as soon as we're in a point where everyone in the UK is at a vaccinated point and is in a safe place. There is absolutely no reason why we need to be having the same concern for uh, vaccines that, that we have now. And when we reach that point, then that's the point where we need to start looking elsewhere and finding where the most effective place to uh, donate our vaccines are. Don't you think we've reached kind of peak vaccine anyway here in this country we seem to be struggling to get more and more people to to uptake i mean you know don't you think we're kind of at that level and we should actually be looking to other countries now and to kind of supporting the rest of the world because there is always this worry that a, a new variant will develop yeah. somewhere else where there isn't any any kind of herd immunity from natural or or, or from kind of um uh, from a vaccine from the vaccine and uh, so i think that you know I, I think it's about time we started sort of doing our bit to help the rest of the world mm. yeah definitely I I don't really disagree with a word you've said, <laughs> actually. Um, we've reached the point where everyone who wants a vaccine can pretty much get one. Um, we're yet to see how, how many sort of of the 12 and up age group will get, that, get one, but I hope to see as many of them do as possible. But once we've reached that point, which I, I think I agree with you that we are pretty much there, then we do need to be looking abroad and sh shipping vaccine to the most effective places to put them. Brilliant stuff. Uh, well, my panel there agreeing with each other. Please don't make a habit of it. By the way, you might have enjoyed some improvised special effects there. Did you notice that Paul Daniels trick where I just disappeared from the sofa? Absolutely. Or what about the moment where I elegantly crossed in front of Tom's camera? We like to prove every so often that this is live TV. It's Tonight Live and we've got lots more to come. <laughs> Looking at the big stories of the day and reflecting on tomorrow's headlines, still with me, assistant comment editor at The Telegraph, Olivia Utley, social commentator and writer Mo Lovett, and political commentator Tom Spencer, who's been to the loo and came back <laughs> in approximately 38 seconds, which is a miracle. And he washed his hands. We're still in a pandemic, don't forget. Now, apparently hundreds of empty offices in central London could be turned into homes in a crazy, crazy post-pandemic new way that we live. As people were sent home to work and continue to do so, hundreds of buildings in the historic city remain unused and largely devoid of life. Their clear desks, empty rooms and lifeless offices could be given a new lease of life as plans are announced to provide 1,500 new homes by the end of the decade. So, Mo, would you like to live in a building that used to be an office? <laughs> would I personally? No. I, I'm, I've, I've, I've just become a bit of a middle-aged suburban woman now. I really mm. like the suburbs, so no, I wouldn't. Actually, Mark, what worries, worries me a lot about this kind of restructuring of the high street and restructuring of the work and working from home and uh, living in an office and, uh, and all that sort of thing is that the whole history of the labour movement is based around collective you know, workers working together. And I think even though we're not 
not in that kind of heavy manufacturing industry that we once mm. were, I think workers are going to lose out if they're isolated working at home. I think, you know, somebody told me um, what was acceptable. Um, we were having a conversation about what, you know, acceptable pay and working conditions. You get all of that because you've been collectivised, because you're working in the workplace together. So I worry that workers are going to be isolated. But we do need, new, we do need more housing. Um, but I'm just concerned that we are kind of abandoning the high street, the city centre model yeah. in terms of all just kind of dispersing into... Well, I, I agree with you, and I think it's a shame that people won't be going back to the office, and I think there will be an economic price to pay. I'm also really worried about a lot of the heavily leveraged office blocks and what that's going to do to pension funds and the wider economy. But I suspect, Mo, that, you know, the, the horse has the, bolted. I, 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 I don't think I know. that people will come back in their droves. And I think you are right. It's a real concern. Mm -hmm. How do you catch the boss's eye? Mm -hmm online you know you can't put your head around the door and have an informal chat with a colleague you can't bump into colleagues and we do that here at team uh, team gb i keep saying team gb because we are team <laughs> GB, but the team at gb news you know we're very collaborative and we are all office based actually you know, even in the if, most part even if the boss is going off on one and it's quite tense at least you can he look across the office that. and you know, he's a very reasonable around. person and actually quite handsome <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, how I you mean, get a pay rise the, 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 i wonder olivia whether young people would seize the opportunity to live in something that was previously an office because young people are desperate to get on the housing ladder. Yeah, for some reason, when, when I read this story, I was imagining living in, like, the penthouse of the Bank of England or something. That was it. Some, like, Street. Beautiful. 1700. <laughs> in, in, the, in the governor's former private quarters. Exactly. That's, and then you shared all those pictures of quite depressing looking office blocks, which obviously is what office blocks look like. And I work in one, so clearly I should know. Mm. Um, I guess maybe they will want to move into them. I think my thing is that, I mean, I agree with both of you on the work from home thing. And I think, I, I think it's really depressing the way we're hollowing out our cities and our high streets. Mm. But also, I sort of think we've already seen people pouring out of central London because they don't have to work in an office, um, I'm not sure if people will sort of want to go and live in offices in the middle of the city when they don't have anywhere to commute to or anything mm. to do in London anymore. Um, so I'm not even sure if it's a particularly practical plan. They also would surely take an awful lot of converting. It's not like they're sort of yeah. ready to... It doesn't seem like the most stress-free way to create um, yeah. lots of housing or a particularly cheap way to create lots yeah. of housing. And are there enough GP surgeries in our city centres? Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Schools, other, other kind of... Park Local runs, services? no park runs in central London. Couldn't, Discovered that couldn't, yesterday. Couldn't live without that. <laughs> Let me be honest with you about that. Tom, what do you think? Um, I think... Uh, with regards to uh, young people, they will live wherever they can find housing because at the moment yeah. there simply isn't enough. I think at the moment in London, we're building about 30,000 pounds a year in a good year. In the 1930s, we were topping around 75,000 since sort of World War II. Mm. We simply just haven't built enough. And I'm willing to try out any sort of scheme to just increase uh, supply. I don't think this alone will do anywhere near enough to actually have a meaningful impact but if it just had that little bit and means a few more families a few more young people have a home then it's worth exploring yes and possibly high street outlets could become apartments too this has been floated as an idea mm, sure so as we're moving to more sort of online shopping people no no longer might feel the need to actually to actually go to, uh, to, to High Street. And if there's not demand for that to be there, then no reason why we should keep it. And we should actually take advantage of, of these changes and use it to do something good and build more houses. Yes, uh, Terry has emailed in 1,500 homes out of offices by the end of the decade. Wow, as many as that. And Terry raises an important point, which is this is just a drop in the ocean, isn't it? And that we need several million new houses. In terms, of, in terms of the housing crisis, yes, I mean, we do. Um, and uh, the thing is, as well, I do think the thing about the offices, like you say, they're not very aesthetically pleasing. I would actually like to see us get back to building houses that people yeah, want yeah. to live in. You know? Houses and streets. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, well said. Welcome back to Tonight Live. There you go. Mo Lovett, deep in concentration there, prepping for her next story, as are my panel tonight, all of them. Um, I'm delighted to have Olivia, Tom and Mo Lovett. They'll be revealing their Greatest Britain and Union jackass before the end of the show. But let's kick off this section with this story. And it's uh, a very interesting one, actually. Uh, let's talk about it. Uh, in the company of my panel, a Turkish bellboy has revealed how he has been left a small fortune by a British guest at his hotel. Charge George 
uh, Charles George Courtney from Hastings struck up a friendship with bellboy Taskin Dazdan after staying at the Coromar Hotel Deluxe in the, <laughs> in the Kuzadazi district of Aden every year. That was a sentence that contained about 11 challenging words <laughs> and I didn't get through it. After Charles uh, sadly died earlier this year, his family were left stunned to find that in his will, the main share of his inheritance was to go to Taskin with some smaller bequests to other hotel members. A lovely story. But here's one that contrasts with that. Check this out. A customer at a restaurant in California shared this picture of a receipt he left for his waitress with a thousand pound tip. And he wrote the following. Beautiful nipples, princess, call me. <laughs> Alongside the master. He signed himself off as the master. That, that's not Doctor Who, is it? And the name of what appears to be a suspended Twitter account. There's a surprise. Hmm. Is that flattering, Olivia Utley? Or rather offensive? I mean, it's really creepy, but I'd take it if it was the thousand pounds involved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've... I've, I've, I've Would certainly, you? <laughs> Is that so bad? I've, yeah. I've certainly had the line, beautiful nipples princess used on me. <laughs> I mean, who hasn't, frankly? <laughs> beautiful. How on earth did he know? How could he know? Um... Yeah, that's a bit awkward, isn't it? But it just goes to show that if you're a waiter or waitress or you're working in hospitality and you're serving someone, you don't quite know what the consequences of that could be. Yeah. It could be quite nice. Well, a thousand pound tip. I mean, I'm not talking about nipple gates. Nice. <laughs> but certainly for the bellboy, he did quite well out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I knew someone who, who gave sort of... 50p, uh, it was a friend of my mum's, who gave 50p to a homeless person every day when she, when he passed her in, in the mm. street. And this homeless person died like 20 years later. It turned out he'd cut himself off from his very rich family. And his rich family found out that there'd been, that this friend of my mum's had been, yeah. and they gave him like 20 grand or something. And that's it was wonderful. amazing. Yeah, that's <laughs> Generosity rewarded, good karma reward. A lovely war. story. Yeah. Uh, but it's important. I mean, do you think that we actually are nice to hospitality staff? Do you think that they get the respect they deserve? I used to work in hospitality and I used to be a waitress for a lot of years. And so if I do very... this, is that like, is that Ooh. very triggering for you? <laughs> Excuse me, young lady. <laughs> yeah. we need... Just don't mention the nipples, right? Salt, salt grind is not working. <laughs> I mean, it's yes and no, isn't it? I worked, in, I worked in sort of country pubs where I waited on tables and restaurants. And I remember my first ever day working Christmas Day and I had just five tables. But it was still quite a lot of courses on a Christmas Day and they each gave me £10. And this was in about 1990 and that was a lot. So I got £50 mm. tips that day. So that was really good. But then I worked in a very high class hotel and the punters were horrible. Mm. <laughs> and I remember I was serving, um, I was serving, you know, silver service and you've got all the uh, mm. sort of uh, balls of consomme. And you know, that part of your skin's really, really delicate. And this consomme was spilling. I wasn't very good at silver service waitress. <laughs> um, and it was spilling onto there and it was red hot. It was oh, actually no. scalding. And I said to the, you know, can I put these down? No, not yet. I'm looking after the baby. And the baby was screaming and, and all the rest of it. Like, but it's been in my hand. And they wouldn't let me put it. And I remember thinking that this baby what are you screaming at I mean, you've got yeah. some spoon in your mouth i thought it's time to get out if you've got that attitude but yes and no mark <laughs> i think it's inconsistent though tom because when it comes to tipping it's accepted that you tip in a restaurant and you maybe tip a taxi driver but you don't tip bar staff and something that i've always found really odd is you don't tip hotel staff who serve meals so if you're staying in a hotel you don't tip anyone for breakfast lunch or dinner yeah it's just a very Unf unfair uh, uh, system really sometimes you'll get a massive tip if you're in certain jobs in certain places mm. and sometimes you'll just get absolutely none so the, the, the culture of tipping has always seemed very odd to me it's something I, I partake in because it seems rude not to but um, there's no re real good reason why people in certain jobs sh should have a tip and people in others um, I, I, shouldn't I mean that's it you know when I've been able to I, I, I've tipped plumbers and I've, I've tipped someone from the AA. Plumbers are oh. minted. Why are you tipping plumbers? Well, well there was plumbers. just one plumber and he just, he went the extra mile uh, to, to um, reroute my pipes. Oh. You know, which, uh, I mean, that's, that's a job and a half, isn't it? That is a job and a half. <laughs> and yeah, he stayed long and he was a, 
supposed to, I think, get away earlier, and he was still there, seven in the evening, yeah. and, I'm, and he had his feet, and I'm like, there's a little bit more, mm -hmm. thank you. And it just felt like it merited it. I think that, that it would be nice if you could tip people where they're not expecting it, but then it would also be nice if you don't tip people who are expecting it that have been rubbish. Yeah, yeah I hate the, like, 12.5% yeah, on every even restaurant Even if the service is bad. Even if the service is bad. And even if you've had, like, 10 different waiters who none of you, you know, if you've got the point of tipping it, I always It's think a decision. That, Yes, and the, 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 point of, the point of tipping waiters is that you've had like a personal relationship with them and they've gone you know, above and beyond, but that only works if there's one of them. You can't have yes. a whole host of waiters. Mm. Then you may as well be tipping, as you say, like supermarket staff and you know, checkout mm. assistants and everything. Although one issue we've got now is the, the cashless society, Mo, means that it's harder to tip because, for example, in a restaurant, if, you, if you're paying with your phone or a card, I mean, first of all, you've got to check if service is included. If it's not included, then they have to extra put an, a new figure in and they're staring at you as you decide how much they're actually worth in fiscal terms. And then you don't know if they get the cash. Do you know that's what occurred to me just the other day as well? Because when I was a waitress, people used to say, do you get to keep your tips or does it go in a pool or does it go behind the bar or whatever? And if you said, I get to keep my tips, they would tip you. And if it was in a pool, they, they wouldn't. So, and that occurred to me the other day when I was paying a restaurant bill and I thought, when I actually said to the waiter, do you get this? And he said, oh yeah, we do. But you you just don't know, do you, if it's, it's, it's kind of part of on the bill. And I, I had that thought myself, Mark, I thought, I wonder if that kind of tradition of tri uh, tipping is going gonna, is gonna to kind of die out a little bit. Because it's, it's, it's predominantly a cash thing, isn't it? It's yeah. leaving a few coins on the table when you leave. It's worse when a homeless person comes up to you as well. And yes. Oh, yeah, no one's got any cash on them. Yeah. yeah. Although I'm delighted to say that big issue salespeople are generally contactless now. Mm. Oh, which is great. Yeah, yeah. So I get mine, I wave my phone at, uh, at this device. And uh, the technology's there, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, quite a sad thing, isn't it? So have you, uh, did you, so, I mean, have, do you all tip generally as a policy then? Mm. You all tip us? Not, yeah, yeah. But it's a good percentage. Oh. 10%, 15? Who can work out? I'm always like, yeah, I'd like to tip, you know, 12% or something. But as you say, the bill comes, the wait is there, and you're like, ah, what's 12% of, you know, <laughs> 72 pounds or whatever, and it's too difficult. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Uh, well, now, Jeremy Clarkson has brought TV viewers plenty of joy with his acclaimed series throughout the years, and Clarkson's farm has been no different. However, Mr Clarkson may also be supplying some people with a different type of joy. Uh, this is a great story. It turns out the land is also being put to a different use as it's reportedly being targeted by swingers who sneak onto the property for secret meetups. According to the Daily Star, exhibitionists have been setting up arrangements on the farm <laughs> after being surprised to find that they weren't prevented from doing so by alarms, electric fences, guard dogs, or an angry Jeremy Clarkson. A source said that there's a massive trend in the swinging community to add extra kicks to meets by arranging them on celebrity land. There you go. See, that's what's happened, Mo. That swinging's got very boring these days. It's got very woke. <laughs> so you've got to, you, you've got to, up you've got to get your rocks off on Jeremy Clarkson's land. Well, all these celebrities go, go and move in office blocks. They won't have gardens, and then they won't have <laughs> swingers in the garden. But, I mean, this is this is why I was re uh, reading up before, Mark. This is a whole world of you know swingers and people meeting in car parks and. Uh, you know, that I just, I just don't understand. <laughs> really Mark don't went to first, though. Interesting. I know, yeah. <laughs> he made assumptions there, yeah. didn't he? <laughs> I think it's, uh, it, it's quite an intriguing story, isn't it? You have to remind yourself that swinging is a big culture. It's, it's a subculture, Tom, but it mm. goes on. Yeah, it's, it's something which I, I guess must be a, a vibrant community from this story. If there's a, enough people who want to go and involve themselves in that in, in Clarkson's farm, then provided they do so lawfully and don't hurt anyone else. And why not? It's, it's not something that I personally understand or would want to partake in, but... They always say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but surely, if that's something which, which brings them joy and they're not harming anyone else, then why not? Although it would be quite upsetting if you found someone on your land getting their rocks off. Mm. Well, might be quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it could be. Poor Jeremy Clarkson, he's had quite a time of it, honestly. He really has. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been quite challenging. But uh, yeah, swinging's not for me. I think if, if, I, if I did swinging, I, I'd be very focused on like the buffet. <laughs> oh, they're good buffets. Yeah, if I was invited to an orgy, I'd be like, will there be food? <laughs> there was a good um, 
There was a good programme about swinging, actually, and they do always have amazing food, really mm. top quality range, yeah. Yeah. I'm when starting you... to feel a bit uptight that I don't really indulge in this. I mean, it was a big thing in the <laughs> 70s, wasn't it? People threw yeah. their car keys in and you'd Correct. see whose car key mm. you got out and all the rest of it. I've obviously just lived a sheltered life. Well, I, I recently threw the keys to my Prius in, in, in the ashtray and they got thrown back at me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a vote of confidence. Did you get that Tesla? Yeah, there's no way, there's no way I'd get away with it. But um, yeah, I, I, apparently after 9-11, there was a, a considerable increase in New York of sex parties, orgies and, and swingers. And this particular piece in the New Yorker magazine sort of speculated that because 9-11 had been such a tragedy, there was this sort of atmosphere where, look, we're all here sort of temporarily, let's have some fun. And the kind of sort of post-apocalyptic vibe where you're yeah. like, what yeah. the hell? Mm. Throw the kind of social rules out the window. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Well, the yeah. stories about in like wars, there are people sort of having sex on the streets during the Blitz. There were genuinely mm. stories about that which I had no idea about. Mm. And I think it's the same sort of thing. It's, you know, we're here, life short, live fast, die young. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I did it after Brexit, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was a really lively couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Freedom Day. Now, uh, interesting stuff. We have obviously been talking about the lorry driver shortage for some time. But now it's getting pretty serious. And let me tell you why. London is reportedly experiencing an MDMA drought. That's a drug. And that's thanks to the COVID pandemic and the disruption of supply lines, experts have said. The cocaine market has also been particularly impacted over the last 18 months, whilst other areas outside the UK capital have also seen drugs shortages. It's thought that numerous factors are involved with some experts downplaying the pandemic and Brexit, but rather attributing the shortage in part to the lack of HGVs carrying goods in from Europe. So Neve Eastwood, the executive director of drugs charity Release, has said that another likely cause for the drought was the fact that MDMA producers in Europe may not be producing the drug in large quantities as many European countries have yet to reopen clubs with England being one of the few to have reopened nightclubs, it's thought that there's not enough demand to warrant manufacturing and distributing the drug. The shortage is unlikely to be a long-term issue thanks to the drug being easy and cheap to produce. Oh dear, well, I don't want to give people ideas. <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a good shortage, isn't it? A drug shortage. Well, sorry, it's a bit gloomy for so late, but it's actually, I read about it, it's quite depressing because people are taking things which oppose it. Drug dealers are selling sort of false MDMA, um, mm. which is much more dangerous. Yes. And they think it might be related to, to a spike in, in drug-related accidents and stuff. Mm. So, I mean, it would be great if it just meant that people weren't taking any MDMA at all, but if they're taking substitutes, it's a bit dodgy. What sorry, is really... MDMA? Ecstasy. Ecstasy. Ecstasy, I see. All right, yeah, well, that, that's obviously very, very concerning. I mean, uh, drug use, have we just accepted that it's with us now for the foreseeable? We'll never win the war on drugs, will we? It's something we can do absolutely uh, nothing about, really. Every time governments have tried to ban anything in history, if you look at the prohibition of, of alcohol in America in the 1920s, it didn't prompt people not drinking. It prompted, yeah. it prompted very violent gangs taking over and becoming very, very wealthy just by controlling the entirety of the uh, supply. And that is the state we're in now. People will always want to take these things, but now rather than people being able to lawfully do it in a safe way, you have, you have hardened uh, criminal gangs controlling the entirety of, of the supply and yeah. making it a very, very unsafe practice with lots of victims. And that's why there's more violence in gangs now because it's become big business, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it is much more on the streets as well, isn't it? And uh, less and less in students. You know, it used to be mm. quite a big thing, a rite of passage at university. Mm. I'm not that sheltered. I had that rite of passage <laughs> too, you know. But it was very much part of student life. But, you know, students are not having as much sex, they're not taking as much mm. drugs, they're not drinking as much. They're much more kind of safety conscious than they were when I was a student anyway. So it's just interesting that's all changing. I mean, it might be good news for Nicola Sturge and that there aren't so much, as so many drugs going up mm. to Scotland because she's got a real problem there um, and I have friends up there who say it's a real real problem when it's on the streets like that and, and, and kind of causing you know people to turn to crime and, and desperation as well but you know the, again it's like it's like you say the underlying thing is that people are kind of using it because they're not very happy with their life and it's kind of a bit of an escapism the whole train spotting thing I think and I 
suppose that would be the way to tackle it rather than just kind of, you know, kind of moralising about it um, in the way that we often do. Too right. RD has emailed in on the subject of swingers. Uh, do not confuse swingers, brackets, buffets and doggers, brackets, nature reserves, car parks and Canvey <laughs> Island. There you go. Specific location. Who knew? Um, Karen Sims. Even if you pay by card, you can still leave a fiver on the table. That's a really good point. Thank you for mentioning that, Karen. Meanwhile, Barbara has uh, some views on living in office blocks, converting offices into housing. I'm way ahead of you. I thought of this years ago when shops and offices started closing. People who work in town without a car might like it, saving on bus and train travel costs. Reasonable rents and managed by housing association sounds good to me. The properties would need to be carefully converted with good soundproofing as many internal walls would have to be erected. Thank you, Barbara. A very good point. Anthony says, hey, Mark, we don't need more houses. We need fewer people living in the country. And finally, from another emailer, where do all these people who need millions of new homes live now? Well, I guess in cramped flat shares. In some amazing scenes, a daredevil pilot has become the first person to fly a plane through a road tunnel twice. Take a look. Quite amazing. I mean, that is James Bond stuff, isn't it? That's Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. And a very brave man. That's, I mean, that really does look like a movie. That's mm. spectacular. Amazing, amazing pictures there. Thanks to Julia and Connor for organising that one. Dario Costa set a new Guinness World Record when he piloted a small aircraft through a set of narrow tunnels. It happened in Turkey. By the way, great tunnels as well. He clocked up speeds of more than 150 miles an hour whilst, whilst blasting through the tunnel, securing his place in aviation history. Not content with smashing one record, the 41-year-old aviator chose a tunnel split into two sections. His double feet at the Katalka tunnels on Turkey's northern Marmara Highway won him Red Bull's prestigious Air Race Challenger class, becoming the first Italian to do so. Costa had to work within millimetre-sized margins to keep the powerful aircraft steady, requiring reaction times of less than 250 milliseconds. The stunt set at least five records, with the pilot also becoming the first to take off inside a tunnel and the longest and fastest flights in a tunnel. Well done to him. And now it's time for this. It's time now for my panel to reveal their Greatest Britain and Union jackass. And Tom, I'll start with you. Who's your Greatest Britain? So for me, the best candidate for the Greater Britain has to be uh, uh, Raheem uh, S Sterling. Um, I mean, just awful uh, racist uh, abuse at the hands of um, Hungarian fans earlier this week. He put in a absolutely amazing p performance and really, really did his uh, country proud. And I, I was just very impressed at the way him and the rest of, of the England team just handled that, that abuse that they received. Mm. Yeah. What do you think, Mo? Uh, my Greatest Britain? Mm. I'm going to go for Sarah Harding. You know, the more I read up about her today, the more I thought she's an impressive young woman. Incredible. Short life, uh, packed so much into it. And even when she started raising awareness of breast cancer, it wasn't in a kind of publicity, me, me, me kind of way. It was in a genuine kind of, I need to raise awareness of this so it doesn't impact on other women. Uh, yeah, so she's my Greatest Britain. A brilliant nomination. I think that trumps everything. Hard to follow that, Olivia. But your Greatest Britain? Well, yes, I've gone, a very, gone down a very different route. I've gone for... Um, Duchess of Rutland. There was a brilliant interview with her in the Sunday Times today. She owns a 356-bedroom castle and during lockdown, um, it, they normally went out for weddings and stuff, but obviously they didn't during lockdown. And so they just rolled up their sleeves and did it all themselves. And she got all her kids roped in. They were chopping wood, wood and making all sorts of meals. And she said, oh, yes, it's the war spirit. And she just seems like a brilliant woman. I'd love she to meet her. She is an amazing <laughs> woman. I love that photograph of her that the team just showed there. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Let's take one more look. It really is quite, 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 uh, quite a scene. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Someone's having a good lockdown. Brilliant stuff. So I hope she tips those staff. Olivia, your Union Jackass. 
well, I didn't think I'd be allowed to have this because he's definitely not British, but I was pleased I was, Justin Trudeau, mm. um, for just organising this election unnecessarily, which it looks like he's almost definitely going to lose. And it's hilarious, just wonderful case of hubristic, uh, you know, total arrogance, just burst. It's, it's yeah. a bit like Theresa May all over again, but it is. with someone so slimy at least, awful. At least she kind of scraped through and managed to govern for a couple of years. Exactly. I mean, this would be so embarrassing and it's so well deserved, so I just love it. <laughs> Brilliant. Mo, your uh, union jackass. Hilary Mantel, we talked about her earlier. What a middle-class snoot mm. that can't be bothered to live in a country because she doesn't like the outcome of a democratic vote. Mm. Whatever happened to lose his consent, I just think she's just as vile. And even the fact that she doesn't recognise that Britain is in Europe, and actually part of the thing that the European Union has done, it's kind of quashed some of those abilities to have different languages and different cultures mm. and different cuisines and all the things that because brilliant in, in the continent of Europe. So mm. she's definitely my jackass. There you go. Nicely bookending the show today. So over to you, your, uh, your union jackass, Tom. Um, and for me, I have to go on with the uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, simply because in 2019, he ran a very successful election under the promise, which is hand signed on every leaflet, that um, there'll be no new a rise in tax and this week we found out that most likely we are uh, going to see a rise in tax with um, national insurance going up so we're going to tax the working population to help fund uh, s social care which I can only see will have utterly catastrophic impacts on his election outcomes whenever that will be. Yeah uh, well look thank you to my amazing panel really enjoyed having uh, all of you Mo, Olivia and uh, Tom in fact I've got a, a dedicated email from Ken who says, uh, I love Tom Spencer, he's awesome. Um, and having a mild stammer on live television must be daunting and he's absolutely smashing it. So there you go, uh, well said Ken. And Ken